<laughs> Denison, welcome, man. How are you? Hey, um, I'm good. Thanks for having me, Carlos. Did, uh, I mean, yeah, you look like a fun dude from like talking before this. So I know this is not going to be one of those awkward conversations in which I'm like trying super hard. <laughs> Um, yeah, man, uh, when your people reached out to me, I was really interested in seeing like the names that uh, are using your infrastructure and are using Tally. And it looks like you also have some history in crypto that goes a while back. So yeah, would you like to just introduce yourself and talk a bit about what Tally is and what you guys do? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so my name is Denison Bertram. I'm a co-founder here at Tally. And Tally is really your all-in-one platform for um, building your community, managing your DAO, uh, and really just, you know, we, we like to say start, grow, and join decentralized organizations. Um, but there's, there's a lot of pieces in there. I, I feel like I'm always workshopping uh, what we say it is, right? Like, is it, are we going to say it's an all-in-one platform? Is it a Swiss Army knife of DAOs? It's your cockpit for, for, for your DAO community. Uh, but really, Tally is a place that you go to to manage and run your decentralized community and where you, you can plug in your decentralized community to get uh, really great tools around voting and proposing, um, recipes to, to have like really secure, safe and trusted uh, proposals for doing things like sending money uh, and, you know, understanding who else is in your DAO, right? Like delegating to fellow uh, participants. Um, to seeing their voting history, their proposal history, understand, um, you know, sort of like how the DAO functions, if it functions, right? Like, do proposals get passed? Do things get done? Um, so that's kind of like a top level of like what Tally is and does. Um, you know, if you're a builder, what we allow you to do is we, we allow you to, you know, essentially go from the Open Zeppelin Library of Contracts. So that would be Open Zeppelin Governor, which is the sort of like leading DAO, DAO tooling um, sort of protocol system, so you might want to call it framework. I think a lot of people like to use the word framework. Um, so that's in the Open Zeppelin library of contracts. So, you, you know, you get your token, you get your, your governor, and then you can come to Tally, and then you can just add it in. And then, uh, you know, you just basically just deploy on chain, add it to Tally, and now you have a place where your, your community can come and vote and propose and uh, do stuff like that. So it's, it's really very cool. Um, and we put a lot of work into it to try and make sure that it um, solves people's problems and makes these communities healthy and thrive. I mean, I, and it all sounds super nice, but it, the, it just gets rounded up when you hear who uses it. And Tally is not only used by you guys yourselves, it's only it's also used by Gitcoin, Compound, Uniswap, ENS, Armor, and quite a bit of others. So, man... I'm just very curious how did how did this all start and how yeah how did this idea came to be? I mean, it's quite a novel field to be creating solutions for the DAO field. Uh, yeah, so um, I have always been into DAOs. I've been in crypto for a long time. Uh, my co-founder and I we used to be part of this uh, Crypto NYC, which is like a New York City based co-working collective. This is okay. like 2016, 2017. Um, and we then had been, you know, in this sort of safe environment, really always kind of hashing out ideas about what the future of crypto would look like, uh, what we can kind of do, what we want to be doing. And what we, what we saw is that decentralized organizations were going to be a thing, right? And we, we, we felt that these things were going to be a thing, but it was too early at the time. There didn't really seem to be enough things that people needed decentralized organizations to run. And that all changed um, in DeFi summer, which now feels so long ago. Uh, and Compound launched a comp and the Compound Governor. And the Compound Governor really set off this idea of like, oh, we can have this like really, you know, th this really clear building block around building large uh, token voting based decentralized organizations. And Raf and I, my co-founder, we saw this and we're like, you know, People are going to need a lot of tooling to understand how this works, right? Because that is not a clearly obvious thing. So that's when we started building Tally. And uh, now it has been more than two years. So it's like a little two plus years later. And actually, a lot of people are now building DAO tools. So I think uh, we're pretty satisfied that we really saw something happening at the right time, really have been able to add a lot of value, uh, make these communities more robust, um, help them, uh, you know, 
get stuff done. Uh, and yeah, that's, that sort of like brings us today, which is a lot of hard work. And one, one thing that I wouldn't underplay is just how um, n novel this all was two years ago. I mean, two years doesn't sound like a lot of <laughs> like a lot of time in like your normal startup context, but in crypto, I, I don't remember the word DAO being that prescient two years ago. Uh, no, it, 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 among the OGs, certainly DAOs were something we we talked about and knew about. But you're right, it wasn't. It was not the way it is today. I mean, today every you know every new corner store on the block is a DAO, right? Right. Um, it, it's it's been really tremendous to see the growth of DAOs. You know, both the the growth of just the acronym and the actual growth of DAOs. Right. I think the 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 number of people who call themselves DAOs or like to use the term DAO is far greater than the the actual number of DAOs out there. Uh, but you're absolutely right. You know, two years ago, this was not an obvious path. I mean, two years ago, we were raising money from investors and you know, sort of had to start the conversation of there's a whole bunch of people and they like get together and they like want to do stuff together on the Internet. And, you know, sometimes their eyes would glaze over and people were like, what are you talking about? Um, today, of course, you know, investors reach out to us and they're like, yeah, we're really deep in like DAO tooling. And you're like, yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, so, so it's, it's just been really exciting to see that, like, we are at the start of a really exciting sort of like, you know, shift in, in, in what's happening in the space and, you know, just really excited to be a part of it. I think, um. I mean, of course, there was the the DAO experiment, um, which blew up tremendously back in the day, like when it almost killed Ethereum. <laughs> and then after that, the term DAO got like a bit of a bad rap, and it never, I mean, it took it quite a while to recover. Now, I would say like, you can go around saying that you're a DAO, and people actually get excited about hearing that rather than saying mm, like that one. Um, Yeah, yeah, the DAO, people still like to talk about the DAO, although it, at this point I feel like it's ancient history, truthfully. Um, yeah, it gave Ethereum a bad rap for a while. It, it definitely chilled DAOs out for a long time. Uh, but it was an early audacious experiment. And I think if you had been around there and you saw it, you would have recognized that, oh, there's some potential here. Right? The idea that the, the smart contracts were, you know, broken and exploited isn't really crazy right like that, that wasn't really uh, a statement on DAOs, right like the fact that like you can rob a bank doesn't mean banks don't work right right um so so the concept there was really strong people did want to pool their money and build cool shit and invest in things right like that was something people really were excited on um so It had to hibernate as an idea for a while because sometimes you have these like negative, um, you know, these negative news cycles and sort of like negative connotations. And it takes a while for enough new people to come who, you know, don't really remember it or don't really care. And also DAOs, DAOs kind of really change, right? Like the DAO today, you sort of like think of it as an investing club in a way, right? Uh, it, it was very different from how DeFi summer DAOs started, right? Like DeFi summer DAOs started by saying, hey, we are a protocol that needs to be managed. And to manage it, we need people. And um, we're going to give them tokens. And that's going to come from some sort of yield farming, some sort of like, you know, uh, uh, distribution mechanism. And then with a the token distribution, you can manage this protocol. And that'll somehow keep us out of jail uh, for having made, you know, competitor to the US dollar. Right. And that is a very, very different value prop than than the DAO itself, right? Like, let's pool our money, let's invest in stuff. You know, Moloch DAO has been very successful at that. The Lao has been very success successful at that. But in, 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 in practice, right, like the return of DAOs was because there was just a different use case that needed to be solved. And uh, when people saw that, they sort of returned and, and the sort of success of doing DAOs for protocols kind of cleared the palette for DAOs in general. And then you saw sort of like the return of applying this idea to kind of everything, like to culture, to society, impact, finance, investing. Um, so we're sort of 
back in love with DAOs, which I'm, I'm thrilled about. In the, um, I, and you're quite right that I'll, a big angle for all of this was the let's keep ourselves out of jail <laughs> angle. Or, or more like, yeah, it, it always like innovation tends to go to these places where uh, the legalities and um, all the technicisms are less defined and you can like to say it again uh, innovate faster or just create new things faster uh, is this a thing you spend a lot of time thinking about or what are the challenges you often tackle uh, in your mind when you're like working with creating DAO tooling Yeah, so the legal question is particularly interesting, and this gets solved kind of in waves. Um, you know, I think maybe about a year ago, there was like a real scare that like the Biden administration was going to really crack down on crypto, and the legal question around DAOs was like hot on the top of people's minds. Um, today, I would say the legal question isn't as much on people's minds. It's still there. Certainly, we, we consider it and think about it, but I think a lot of Regular people have gone back to the sort of excitement of building DAOs, right? There's always sort of something that like puts people off a little bit uh, and then they get over that and then they get back to building DAOs, right? So, you know, people were building, you know, these social DAOs were like, hey, we're going to um, buy a, I don't know, a thing, right? And we're all going to live there together and we're all going to like put in our tokens and we're all going to vote on how it gets run, You know, I don't think that these people are super duper concerned about like, you know, Elizabeth Warren showing up at their house with like the, the Senate Judiciary Committee and subpoenaing them in front of like the United States of America, right? There, there's bigger fish to fry. I think the large, large, large protocols are still very cautious and very considerate and very thoughtful. Um, but in general, I think the, the legal question is sort of like dimmed a bit in people's minds in terms of like being concerned. That said, a lot of people also take it a lot more um, professionally. You know, people are getting uh, legal protection, right? There are some DAO tooling companies that uh, sell you like legal wrappers for your investment DAO. Um, you know, people who participate DAOs like to do it through their own LLCs. Um, so, you know, folks are both simultaneously not thinking about it as much as they used to and already sort of normalizing on what sort of like minimum viable protection they need to like think about it at the end of the day i think like most people are on the opinion of if you're doing something absolutely illegal it's probably not really going to save you um being a dao uh that said it, it wouldn't hurt i suppose uh but you know for the people who aren't doing things illegal and they're trying to do it the right way i think they are in the sort of ask forgiveness later camp where they're saying hey you know We are trying to make the world a better place with this DAO. You know, what we really think of as our like legal exposure feels minimal. But yeah, it's it's definitely been an evolution in terms of like um, who is worried and who's not. I, I think the, yeah, yeah, you're right. And also like it, it, it'll, nowadays the road to decentralization looks a lot clearer. Uh, nowadays, I mean, And you even see it as a deadline where uh, protocols or projects would launch and they see that they need to be fully decentralized by some point, either because if they don't, they'll eventually be found liable for creating something. Uh, and this I see a lot of in the privacy community. But um, uh, th th that's just like me just continuing to surface around the, um, around the legal bits. But... Like going back to that question, what is often in your mind when it comes to DAOs and when you're designing this bunch of tools for, for them? Uh, from a legal point of view? No, in, just in general. Because I know that there's a lot of, a bit of game theory that goes into it. There's a sure. bit of, of course, there are politics, everything. But I don't know sure. which problems interest you the most. Uh, so there's a lot of problems that like really get me about DAOs. I think the one that is sort of captured my attention recently is the social sort of social dynamics of DAOs. Mm -hmm. um, it's, this is sound very strange, but when you talk about smart contract development, people are pretty candid about saying that they're building their smart contracts with the assumption that they are deployed in malicious adversarial environments and they have to be hardened 
to account for uh, dangerous actors who are attempting to um, exploit them. Uh, lately, I've been thinking about how maybe we need to consider the same for communities, right? Smart contracts, you know, are exploited by other humans, other people. Uh, and it's kind of the same for our communities as well. How do we d design communities that are robust and resilient to malicious actors that would uh, do them harm? And this is something that's very difficult to like codify in, in smart contracts, right? Because, um, you know, the difference between a, a negative governance proposal and a net positive governance proposal is really just in the opinion of who's voting. Right. Like, is this a governance attack or is this a unpopular proposal? Um, right. And and that's that's very difficult to write. You're hoping the community community um, sort of like stands steps up and handles that correctly. But what you see is that you, you see in some communities uh, really concerted long term negative actors who participate and kind of groom groom the community towards. Uh, different decisions which actually sort of intend to just capture value rather than really provide value. Uh, there's also, it's interesting, so going through the um, the experience of like index co-op co or coop, I'm not sure how, how they pronounce it, um, how this sort of like product development had kind of like grown to, uh, to, to like a halt because there was a lot of zero-sum thinking. Uh, that happened in like the community where it was very difficult to find compromise on the internet with folks in the sort of communication mediums that we have, right? Where, uh, you know, it's very easy to like, you know, crap on somebody's idea without necessarily providing a viable alternative. Um, and certainly in some communities, you, you have this, this effect where people say no to everything, but don't try and like improve an idea, right? It's not like saying, oh, your idea is bad. Let me help improve it like this. Um, people can sometimes launch into these tirades of like, you know, you scammer, you want to be paid for your work? How dare you, you know? <laughs> um, and and that, that, that becomes a very difficult environment in which to build product, right? Or in which to like successfully move forward. So what you see is like, or what I've been, sort of like really interested in lately is how do we ensure that we have these like positive communities and how do you build communities that like exist in a world of malicious participants? I'm not sure if you've been following on Twitter, there's sort of like a running thing um, among web three companies who are hiring where it seems like um, North Korean hackers are trying to like get jobs in crypto companies. It's yes. I've been, I've been seeing a lot of that. So even at Tally, we went through the same thing where you have people who apply to like work in your team. And if you look at them close enough, it's clear that it's a sham. It's a, you know, it's, 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 it's not real. Uh, and these people are trying to like basically, you know, Mission Impossible infiltrate your like organization for whatever reason, right? And this happens to DAOs as well, right? Where, you know, they're open permissionless things and people come in and we sort of, you know, there's this idea of you judge people on their actions, right? Like how they contribute. So how do we manage it if people come in uh, with the intention of being these long-term uh, cons, right? Where they come in and they're like, oh yeah, I'll contribute. They push code, they build things, right? But really it's this long-term intention of being a, a fraud, um, which is, is is not the norm for communities, right? But is is interesting to consider because lately we see more of it, where where DAOs are a little bit, you know, um, in a good way, a little bit kumbaya, you know, like oh, it's the future, it's it's all great, you know, um, Aries and Aquarius, it's going to be good. Uh, but we sometimes have to realize, yeah, but you know, like you know, you still have a treasury of a billion dollars, like you know, North Korea wants that. Right. right. Uh, so, so, you know, what is the resources of a state actor against like a bunch of people who meet up in discord? You know, it's very, it's very like, it's, it's a big question, right? And you look at even projects that are actually malicious from the start and I won't name names. So I don't seem 
um, to be taking sides. But there are a number of like DeFi protocols where people are calling it a DAO, but really it's just them themselves, somebody else that's them and somebody else's dog, which is also them on a multi-sig and calling it a DAO, right? Uh, and then, you know, you know, whatever excuse is necessary to sort of like justify that, oh, you know, we need to hold your money ourselves so we can act fast and like invest it properly and give you the best returns. And it's just like, yeah, okay. Uh, but how, how, how is it decentralized? And, and in what way are, is the community actually protected against bad actors? Because then sometimes even the creators of DAOs can be the bad actors themselves, you know? Uh, so, so I, I, I spend a lot of time thinking about that sort of thing these days, right? Like, how do we, how do we know that our contributors have, are, are good contributors, right? A lot of this is leap of faith stuff, right? Like, you know, you start a wild organization on the internet, um, you kind of have to end up at some point trusting uh, wild people on the internet, right? Like, it's, that's what you set out to do. Um, so yeah, that, those are, that's, that's kind of like what's on my mind lately. And it's a tough, it's a, it's a, it's a kind of a wild question. I imagine because I, I think like, and you see this, like, of course, online people have more incentives to be wilder, <laughs> to just be like, try and be edgier. Uh, you have, you end up meeting people who appreciate spending a lot of time in front of their computers, uh, talking to strangers, which is not like every normie out there i mean there's there's a very specific type of people that get associated with crypto in particular and that's for a reason right like the, the stereotype to some degree holds true uh so, so yeah i would imagine that that's a something that plays a big part in it and if you if you go to DAOs and like the few DAOs that i usually end up like going in and snooping to see what they're saying because i don't participate in any but are gitcoin and uniswap and both of them use uh, use tally and you see that even by the the writing style you see that a lot of these people are very similar and so what it often happens is that it this model tends to create a small eco chambers on its own right. How, how do you think about this? Or do you think that's just a matter of like DAOs becoming more predominant in the culture? Uh, yeah, I'm not really sure, honestly. Um, there's definitely a DAO echo chamber. Um, there are definitely people who live from sort of causing controversy in DAOs. You know, as I mentioned, there's, there's plenty of people. You'll always find people who think your idea is bad. Right. Um, it's a lot harder to find people who who think the idea that you have is good. It just needs a little bit of help to make it better. Um, so, you know, you end up having this weird sort of... You also sometimes have like a misalignment of incentives, right? Where, you know, there's this this funny quote that I've sort of like said a million times, but... Um, the way DAOs give out membership tokens is, is weird, right? Like if you were riding your bike and you got hit by a car and they took you to the hospital, should you get hospital governance tokens because <laughs> you were in the hospital? Right. And that's how a lot of people get tokens and different things, right? Like they happen to come by and buy something or use something via some other protocol or something else like that. And then there's an airdrop and suddenly, Oh, they have tokens. Right. Um, and now we expect them to do a great job in running something, right? It's like, you know, you walk down the street, you looked at somebody and a year later, turns out you were married and now you have to like run that relationship. Like, are you going to be a good spouse in, in this sort of thing like you didn't even understand you were getting into this thing in the first place um so when, when you think about that for like protocols you end up having holders that either you, you have this weird thing where you have a whole bunch of people who got it and they never did anything for it and don't really care all they see is free money and they get rid of it and then you have groups of people who see an opportunity and they just quickly buy up the tokens that people got rid of and now you kind of start off with a weird balance. You start off like with a weird, um, a weird membership, 
right? Like the people who didn't care are gone. The people who do care probably hold their tokens. And the people who like sense an opportunity buy. Uh, and then, then, then they vote, right? And what they vote on or how they behave is is really interesting, right? And this really depends on the, you know, this is like, it depends from organization to organization. But, you know, Uniswap in the past has had trouble passing really large proposals, not because the idea of the proposal wasn't good, uh, but because not everyone really understood what the proposal was about or why it was important. You know? Right. Um, something else that happens is sort of like failure mode in communities is uh, people have a really, really, people are really bad at judging what fair compensation for work is for others, right? So you can have people in DAOs that participate by just, you know, hanging out in the Discord, uh, and then someone will be like, oh, I want to get paid for my work. And people, people will be like, well, how much do you want to get paid? And people will say, well, I live in San Francisco, so I need $150,000, right? And people will be like, Fuck no, man. I've got like a dog, a best friend in Ohio who can do it for 30. This is a ripoff, right? And, you know, you have these global communities and people have a really weird reaction to like pricing, right? Like some people live in like, you know, cheaper, lower cost of living uh, environments. Um, so they don't understand why the DAO is paying for someone in a higher cost of living environment. Um, People don't understand the cost of talent, right? Like the cost of passion and being a community, right? Like, yeah, a front-end developer in San Francisco is going to be vastly more expensive than a front-end developer somewhere else. But the front-end developer somewhere else didn't show up in the community, hasn't been here, and didn't propose something, right? Um, so you end up in this thing where people say, oh, well, you're too expensive. We shouldn't spend the money like that. And it's like, okay, but where's your alternative? Have you like mm. put through the effort to like, are you going to project manage some dev team coming out of some other country? No. Well, then now we need to pay a project manager, right? So it becomes very difficult sometimes to find consensus on these things because the membership can just be so varied, right? Like, um, you know, the Uniswap one, I think is a great example. Uh, maybe like a year ago, they, they wanted all this money for a legal defense fund. And they asked for a lot, admittedly, a lot of money. And, but, you know, they were like hiring like lawyers on Capitol Hill who are extremely expensive and like top notch, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, people's response to it was just like, ah, the lawyers here in my town, they're cheaper. We should use one of them. And it's just like, you know, the, the sort of like scale of the, the challenge wasn't clear to users. And the value prop was was difficult to explain, right? And this can happen across like a lot of different things. But what what you sort of end up happening is you, you, you sometimes have these like discussions in DAO communities where like people just aren't aligned, right? Where mm -hmm. where you know it's hard sometimes to keep the high level goals in mind. Where you say, what is the high level goal? We want to build A. Okay, so if we're paying too much for A, was our goal to save money or was it to build a right and then people can get hung up on well it's too expensive we should be saving money you're like okay but you know we didn't define saving money as one of our like our goals this quarter because the easiest way of, to save money of course is just not spend any of it right um so those sorts of things can lead to sort of like a lot of misalignments the 24-hour nature of DAOs can lead to misalignments right like someone could come in in Korea time and like great give a great explanation and like convince everyone who's online at that moment and then it scrolls up and then you know the sun rises in New York and the process has to start all over with like a different cohort of like users who are online um, so yeah a lot of challenges in that regard I'm sort of like talking about everything but, but yeah, a yeah. Lot of challenges but, but but there are many things that come with DAOs that by nature are hard and they like since we've spoken about the problems it's also good to speak about the good things uh, and i think um when we i mean this is fun because <laughs> funny because it wasn't even a dao that this happened to but you saw like in the later days uh, of course terra blew up we all heard the mm -hmm. us ust blew up whatever um 
And you see that, of course, then they're tasked with finding uh, a way to solve this. And you can judge Do Kwon's intentions in any way you want. But what ended up happening is that he decided that the best thing to do was to go to the community and present a couple of proposals and see what people thought about them. And well, what was very interesting and what ends up happening to the in Dao's quite naturally, which I find really interesting, is that the whole first proposal started a great a huge discussion, not only in the proposals comments where the discussion was supposed to happen, but just on Twitter and all over the crypto ecosystem where people were just talking about this proposal and why they thought it was good or why they thought it was bad. And as it often happens with these things, it's just a matter of someone finding the right way to articulate one problem with the proposal until everyone just starts talking about it. And the whole thing becomes like the main point uh, that informs proposal number two in this case. And I found it really interesting to follow this, uh, evol- this quote-unquote natural evolution of the proposals as more ideas were presented. And I think that's what DAOs are good at. DAOs are good at like providing fast feedback, which, like you said, is often negative. But often in DAOs, you can also say that the lack of negativity is... Uh, Pretty much like yeah, a pat in the back that says okay, you're doing some, you're doing something right here. Um, yeah. What, what is what the latest you... proposal for Terra? The latest proposal, I think, um, the latest that I know of was this one that involved the forking the blockchain into one called the Terra Classic, and then keeping sure. the regular Terra. But but there was something new. I just keep. I just can't remember right now. Yeah, I, I don't. I don't remember the exact details of the of the latest one. I mean, there, there's the uh, there's another thing here, and not saying this is this case, but there is an opportunity to ask the community in a way that sort of like, you know. Was Terra a DAO in the first place? No. Um, no. Does it make sense to like speak to the community as if like they had a decision in how they got screwed in the first place? And to like sort of ask them now, it, it's like weird, right? Yes. Like, because people, you know, think like, what was it, Daniele, like Wonderland, you know, he had this tweet where he said, okay, enough of this. I am the Dow now. Um, and you're sort of like, okay, right? So like you run the, you know, the decentralized autonomous organization, right? Like someone was making jokes that it was like the Daniele autonomous organization. Um, <laughs> or no, Daniele autocratic organization. It's, it's like, I, I think we have to be very careful of like how people deploy the idea of community and the idea of DAO, right? Um, just because, you know, it would be really unfortunate if the, the the narrative becomes like, oh yeah, DAOs are like, you know, XYZ's collapse or DAOs are like, you know, this shit coin or DAOs are like this scam. You know, that, that would be very disappointing. What, what are your feelings in general about because I've seen that coin voting has been getting a lot of heat lately, and which is what happens every time that Vitalik speaks, <laughs> opens his mouth to say something bad about something. Like the general discourse t- turns into into against that thing. I guess I actually like coin voting, and I like coin voting for a number of re- easy reasons. Um, well, let me take a step back. Uh, people who don't like coin voting, I think, really are talking more about they don't like how coins are distributed, hmm. right? Um, there isn't anything inherently wrong with one token, one vote, right? Maybe there's something inherently wrong with, like, you have all the tokens and I have one token, right? But there isn't anything inherently wrong with, with coin voting, in my opinion. the 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 part that I think people rally against is 
there hasn't really been much creativity or mechanism design around how we properly distribute these tokens and what these tokens properly mean and how these tokens weighted in the voting process, right? Um, and, you know, a lot of the alternatives that these people suggest, in my mind, tend to be a little dystopian. You know, it's sort of like, you know, world coin style, scan your eyeballs, everyone's unique person. Um, I really dislike attempting to identify every human being with like absolute precision. Um, I think that's very dangerous. Uh, I also don't think that it's necessarily very helpful, right? Like I don't think there's anything particularly different about coin voting and human voting, right? Uh, once again, it's all about like how they're allowed to vote, right? Like if one human has more votes than other humans, I'm not sure how that changes anything. Uh, additionally, reputation is something I'm not really a big fan of. Um, people talk about reputation um, as though it's a solution, and indeed it's pretty interesting as a solution. Um, but reputation is very uh, cohort based, right? You know, if you saw, you know, the, this last cycle, especially with the NFTs, people didn't even know who Vitalik was, right? Like the people that they trusted the most in the ecosystem were whatever NFT shills onboarded them into the ecosystem, right? Right. So they yeah. get onboarded between by some rando who is like now an NFT like overlord because they have like a million followers and they have the reputation. But these people may not have any sort of alignment with the value system that we have or et cetera, et cetera. And when you think about it, like the next cycle, there'll be someone different. And th this person's reputation that they've earned through a lot of hard work in this cycle isn't necessarily going to be portable in the next cycle, right? Like there, there were people that I remember there was something really funny on Twitter a while ago. Someone was like, who the hell is this guy Vitalik, right? <laughs> like someone was like saying this and like people were like, who cares? Who's this Vitalik guy, um, right? Like, so for me, reputation is who is in your set of people who sort of, for whatever reason, have like onboarded at the same time or like conglomerated around this, like uh, coalesced around this like idea in the same moment, right? Um, nobody is following the early, you know, like Gavin, you know, the first core developer of Bitcoin. I don't even know what he's doing anymore. But if he came up today and said, we should do this, nobody would listen to him, right? Um, there's a lot of early Ethereum folks who did foundational stuff. Um, if they showed up today and just said X, Y, Z, you know, the OpenSea users wouldn't give a shit. Right? They wouldn't listen to them, right? So to build systems where you have reputation, I actually feel like you're building systems that are more susceptible to, to um, uh, populism, right, to demagoguery. Where, where because people are loud or people are ever present or people are somehow trendy, um, they have more reputation. Right? Now, you can do other reputation systems based on things like pushing code, right, on GitHub. But then, of course, you exploit, not exploit, you exclude uh, the people who do all this work on the social level, right? Like community managers for whom, mm -hmm. you know, DAOs could not live without effective community managers. Right? And how do you properly capture their reputation in a way that isn't going to end up being, you know, cohort based, right? Uh, you worked here when I joined, um, so I trust you, right? Then you left because you had some family issues and someone else did it and now nobody trusts you anymore. They don't know you anymore, right? Uh, especially when like the size of the audience grows each cycle, right? Like it's one thing to be one of the OG developers of something and be really well known in a group of a thousand people. And then you go mainstream and tomorrow there's a million people and all 999,000 of them that like just joined, uh, joined because of some Twitter personality. Now nobody knows who you are. Right? So I think that, that that's like kind of like where, in my opinion, like reputation sort of tends to break down. And again, like with coin voting, I think it's about how you distribute the tokens, right? Like, yeah, it doesn't work if you go to the hospital and they like, put you in charge in the hospital just because you got hit by a car. Right. Um, right. It doesn't make sense. Like, you know, you supplied liquidity to um, protocol X, you don't know shit about derivatives. Why do you, you know, why should you be voting on like core protocol stuff? Right. Um, that doesn't make sense. Right. And, and, and that is partially, I think, because there's a little misalignment there also of like purpose. 
right? Like for some DAOs, the legal cover comes from really wide distribution of like tokens, right? So they, they sort of intend to distribute really widely when they know in their hearts there's only like 20 or 30 people who have like the, the, the proficiency to actually properly run the system and, and like participate in an educated way. So it ends yeah, up being think, this uh, like... Yeah, you, you simplified very nicely with the, with the hospital example, but, but I think it really, you can even take it a step forward and say, okay, now you're trusted to govern the hospital. Are you going to govern the hospital? Of course not. You, you don't want to do that. Like you don't care about governing a hospital. You have no idea how to do it. You just receive these tokens that are valuable. So what happens in the end of the day is that you're going to sell it, of course. And when yeah. you sell your tokens, the person that's on the other side to buy it is one person that's just waiting to get more influence in the hospital. So yeah. you're quite right, I would say, when you point out that it, the problem isn't really that people are uh, able to buy governance the problem is that people who shouldn't have had governance in the first place are able to sell it and just get it for free and they have all the incentives in the world to just yeah. completely drop it yeah they are the supply for aggressive takeovers right like exactly if you didn't drop tokens to people who didn't care or didn't want to be involved, there wouldn't be this supply for like outside bad actors to like swoop up. You know, right? So, uh, and if it does the same thing, if I um, let, let's say it's I I play in a band or something, so so like I have one out of four bolts in that band about what's going on, and if someone comes in and says, "Hey, I want to buy your your spot in the band just to have more influence," it'd be like, oh, "Fuck you!" Like I I wouldn't take your money, what however much you offer, because like you're just like proposing something insane that's trying to. I don't know, have some Machiavellian influence over people. Yeah, yeah. like this, the incentive side bet would be a lot stronger. Um, yeah. In, in, that, uh, in that line, because we're getting to something quite interesting there, have you put any thoughts into how would you like uh, tokens better distributed to people? Yes, um, I have. And I don't have the perfect solution for this. But one DAO project that I created recently called Pride Punks has been kind of an exploration of a different way of token holder governance. So the, the thing that I was experimenting with there is you have a Pride Punk NFT and with it, you can claim I'm one... Sorry, just for audience context and for my curiosity, what does Pride Punk do? Like, what's the purpose of this DAO? Uh, so the purpose of the DAO, it, it, originally, um, the purpose is to to support and promote LGBTQ plus interests in Web3. Okay. Um, this, came, this came from an NFT project I had done originally in 2018 and then brought back to life, uh, sort of like a political art statement, um, but as sort of like a second phase or a sort of follow on to that to make it more interesting. Um, and because I love DAOs, the idea was, okay... Um, for the people who wanted to hold the artwork, um, it would be really cool if there was also a DAO that they could participate in, right? So it's sort of like a second life that exists after, you know, you do like a distribution of NFTs. Uh, but to your point, um, it didn't, I don't like the idea that just because you hold something, especially because you think there may be speculative value there, despite how much you may tell someone there is no speculative value, people hear speculative value anyway, which is frustrating um but to make sure okay the dao should be at least somehow insulated from that right mm. so you have the nft and with the nft you can claim a voting token and the voting token is a non-transferable nft that represents one vote and the mechanism is it's one vote per nft and address okay so if you have one address that has 100 NFTs, you can claim one voting token. If you have one address that is one NFT, you can claim one voting token. And you can do this every three months. So if you have one NFT, you claim a voting token, and then you sell it, the new person who buys it has to wait three months until they can claim theirs. Right? Not perfect, but a design. Right. 
the idea here being is on Ethereum, claiming things is expensive, right? So you're going to have to be a little bit motivated. Uh, you know, you could try and Sybil attack by, uh, you know, if you have 100 uh, uh, Pride Punk NFTs, you could send them to 100 different addresses and then claim from 100 different addresses and then vote from 100 different addresses. Uh, but um, the barrier to entrance, like the the uh, is is linear, right? Like every each additional one, you know, your cost of like doing the sort of delegation and claiming process goes up. Uh, so you have this pool of voting tokens, but it's an ex increasing supply, right? So today we all claim once in our first three month period, um, so we all have sort of like equal voice. Next quarter, maybe half the people lost interest and dropped off. Well, they're probably not going to claim their vote token, but the people who are still there and still care will claim a new vote token, right? So over time, the people who care um, dilute the people who don't care, right? Because today, if you get airdropped most protocol tokens, right, and you don't care on day one, you have just as much voting power, um, you know, 10 years from now as you do today, which doesn't really make sense. You haven't been around. You didn't do anything. You didn't help. You, nobody cares, right? Um, but that's the sort of design around token voting today. You sort of like vest early and get all of your equity up front day one, and you don't have to do anything to like maintain it. So instead, this design that I've been experimenting with dilutes out non-participants, mm -hmm. but also allows new participants to always join and build their voice, right? You can join a year from now, and if you start claiming and claiming, you will be diluting out the voice of the folks that joined today but haven't done anything since then, right? So it's a little bit more equitable in terms of being um, long-term successful in, like, supporting a community uh, and a little bit fairer in how did you get this token in the first place, right? Like, because it's an inflating supply and maybe you, you know, bought a Pride Punk early, it doesn't mean that that voting power sort of stays with you forever. And you have um, a sort of like you, you, the, the financial value in this sort of like idea is always in the NFT. You don't buy and sell the voting tokens, right? They're non-transferable. So there's no market for them, right? There's always a market for the NFT. And if people are willing to buy up the NFTs um, and then go through this process of like claiming and delegating, which is expensive, uh, then you've made this barrier to entry high enough that uh, at least there's some base level sort of like schemer that that doesn't that doesn't like go through that. So it sort of acts as a filter. Now, no, it's new. I, I, find I don't know. If interesting, man. Uh, the the NFT part in particular. I, I mean, I, I think that's a clever workaround to like not have people immediately gain gain voting power. Yeah, yeah. In my, I, I mean, you're. You probably know a lot of people that work in DAOs or that collaborate with DAOs or that have DAOs. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> One would think so, right? Um, and I personally, like, I know a lot of crypto people. I know almost none that participate or that collaborate with DAOs. So, like, if you say, like, someone just gets very interested in, like, this conversation and, and says, hey, I can go into Tally and register a DAO just like this. That's pretty cool. But, like... Now, how the fuck do I get members for my DAO? I don't know, how would you how would you go about that conversation? So that is a feature that we are going to be building out because yeah, that's so hard. hard. That's really hard. There's a lot of ways that people do do that today, um, but that is, that is hard, and we we recognize the need for better tools around that because today the answer is sort of like, well, you give out tokens, and people are like, how? And I'm like, uh, you're on your own. Um, so yeah, we are building out some better things to help token distribution be a little bit easier. Um, getting membership for your DAO. Yeah. Cause that, that's a, that's a big blocker to a lot of like mass adoption. And you need people who care. Like, I mean, and there are very different use cases, right? Like if you were, 
And there was this doubt I wanted to buy the U.S. Constitution, right? So, and yeah. if you're a bit of a bit of a meme like that, uh, people can actually get very interested very fast, uh, or not. But like, at least it's very clear what you're trying to do. If you're doing something like Uniswap, back to that example, because we've been just bridging around it, I think. Um, in that case, like you actually want like a, a type of member that's very in tune with with building financial products, which creates a bunch of challenges of how do you find competent people that have time to do this kind of thing and that are interested, etc. Yeah. Um, for something like your project that was more artsy or something, how did you go about finding members for that? Um, so. That was that was interesting. For, so for Pride Punks, uh, originally there's an artwork, there's an NFT that you could purchase in the mint, right? Like um, I had always intended to to you know do a mint where you sort of just buy it the way you would buy art. You know, it was very political art. I was adding rainbows to Crypto Punks, which sounds lame or really low effort today. Uh, but the thing that's unique here is I was the first person to think of it. 2018. Um, and also for me, it was a very important statement on like inclusivity in Web3 uh, because I was literally saying like making your crypto punk gay, right? And especially at a time and you know, that time continues today where like people have difficulty like approaching um, topics that you know, revolve around like gender and inclusivity and orientation and stuff like that. So it, it felt especially that and very strong thing because there really only was crypto punks as like you know, artwork on the blockchain to, to remix it and create this like political statement and be like, yeah, well, you should, you know, you, you should have this like art, but it should actually be like, you know, political art, not just like eight big characters. Um, so the idea was to sell those. The catch is, and the sort of like challenge for the community has been that um, because it's considered an historical NFT and there's sort of like just value in the fact that, you know, I, you know, there's been a million CryptoPunk derivatives, but you know, there's value in the fact that I thought of it first, right? And had tried to do something specifically with it. Um, a lot of people wanted to purchase it for speculation, well, which, you know, was great for me. I was selling it, like fantastic. Uh, but it hasn't been the easiest to convert people over from um, their speculative mindset to participating in an organization around like LGBTQ plus interests, right? Even though you can tell people, hey, this is what it's about, they sometimes don't care and show up and like want to see in it what they want to see in it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you definitely have these conversations in the Discord where people are like, fuck LGBTQ, let's make money. And you're like, well, that's not what the <laughs> point is. And people are like, who are you? Why do you get to decide what the point is? And you're like, it. I was, you know, trying to suggest the point. Fuck it, we just want to make money. Um, so it becomes a little bit of me uh, having the same sort of hospital example, where you're like, uh, okay, you you got this artwork, and now surprise, you're all in this gay club, um, and and you know, not everyone <laughs> really like responds to that well, right? Like, there's been a, actually there's a core group of people who have really just been awesome, and they have like a proposal up, and they're like building out a marketing a program like there's a core of people who really care and really love the idea and they want to be there and do this uh but you know there's been a lot of people who for whom you know they got hit by a car they went to the hospital they got governance tokens and they're like what do we need x-ray machines for okay <laughs> throw them out you know um and then you have to like talk about well we need x-ray machines for the patients and they're like patients who cares about patients you know um so, so it's it's been challenging to say the least, uh, but it's been rewarding too, and I'm really pretty excited about how it's coming together. Uh, so, I, I, I think that's that's a big part of it as well because uh, the, the speculation angle for a lot of people that join DAOs, of course, it's a big uh, it's a big factor, right? So when you talk to to people that are governing your project, they might end up more interested in how it makes them money to resell the NFT rather than the purpose around it. And that just goes for, I don't know, call it the Gitcoin token. Uh, Gitcoin's yeah. purpose is to fund public goods. But if you get too many people that care too much about the token in there, then the proposals are going to be 
designed so the token goes up in price, and also that more public goods are funded. That's just yeah, a bit uh, a bit unfortunate. Yeah, that is that is real. Like no joint that joke. That's like a real thing. Um, you have something. You're like we're building public public goods. Um, we are trying to do something. Uh, you know, future oriented, and people are like my bags, token prices are going down, do something. Um, and that that's very negative, right? Like, you know, devs do something, you know, that this, you know, you do get these communities where folks are like, uh, the value of the token is going down, do something. And it's just like, well, what if the point of this is not the value going up? Um, and people just like, lose their shit if you say that right so for for some of these DAOs, like i think gitcoin has to deal with this as well uh all these DAOs have to deal with it but i think it depends a lot uh, based on how accessible it is right some communities like compound are so highly technical that by and large um their user base doesn't come up with questions like that um but other other communities that are more accessible uh and people enter because of speculation and accessibility you end up having that that conflict of like, we're here to pump our bags. That's what the DAO is. And it's just very short-term thinking because once those people pump their bags, they're gone. Right. right. So they, they don't they don't they don't live with the outcome of their decisions um, at all. And that that's very hard for a community to to deal with because there's no way for you to know that that's why they're there. Right? Like, you know, they, they are I'm like saying I'm just here for the money. Yeah, no one likes saying I'm just here for the money, right? Um, so, yeah. Man, uh, I know you have to run, so it, it's just been great to have this chat with you. Uh, welcome anytime you want to you want to come back on the podcast. Um, yeah, Thank I, you. I had a lot of fun. Uh, is there anything you'd like to say to our audience before we, before we finish? Uh, no, not really. I would say go out there and build DAOs. There's a lot of challenges, but I think we, we need people to, to frontier on them, to find these challenges, to, to find these solutions, because there are solutions to them. Uh, I do think these things work, um, and we need you. That's not what you can do for – what is it? That's not what your DAO can do for you. Ask what you can do for your DAO. And well, th thank you for building such a cool product for crypto, man. I'm sure that a, a lot of cool DAOs are going to get funded because of this and j just because you guys are making it easier. So props to you and thanks again for coming. Thank you. My pleasure.